Welcome to Happy Homes and Gardens. I'm your host. My name is Daphne Royce. I am a real estate broker, architecture, and interior designer. Champagne was originated in the 17th centuries in France and was often served at Marie Antoinette's extravagant parties in Versailles. We still consume champagne at most of the celebrations. Gary Westby has a very special job as a champagne buyer. I am excited to have him here. Tell us all you need to know about champagne. Hi, Gary. Hi, how are you? Thank you so much for having me on. Doing well. Please tell us about you and how you became the champagne buyer. Well, I've been doing the champagne buying for k Wine Merchants now for uh, 22 years. I started in 2000. Um, but I got my, my passion for wine from my father, who's still a avid collector and, and wine lover. Um, he's actually coming this weekend and we'll probably, uh, well, we'll definitely open some nice bottles while he's here. Um, so that's how I got my start. I was basically, uh, playing music. I was, uh, playing the bass as part of a really rotten living. And, um, my dad told me that hey, instead of uh, working part-time in bike shops, you should work part-time in, in a wine shop. Um, and I, I, I looked around for a job and I got hired and I got a raise. And I tell you the only way you can get a raise in the wine, by joining the wine business is if you're in the bike business. <laughs> but it's, um, it's been a huge, huge passion and gigantic luck um, for me to, to end up specialized in champagne. Um, I was working with a competitor of K and L's that unfortunately has gone out of business, um, during the run up to uh, Y2K. So, um, in 1999, and there was a huge amount of interest in, in champagne. Um, and that's where I really got my love for champagne was on the job. Um, and starting in 2000, the first recession with uh, the dot bomb really um, allowed an opportunity to expand into direct importation of champagne, as well as dealing with the um, the big brands that that control most of the U.S. market. So now at K and L, we're we're doing both. You know, you can find, of course, you can find giant brands like Veuve Clicquot and, and Dom Perignon, um, uh, but you can also find very, very small growers, some having as little as seven acres of land um, and oftentimes at very, very interesting prices. Is a champagne sent as a sparkling wine? You know, that, that's, a, that's a great question because there's a lot of confusion um, with the word champagne. You know, champagne is a is an appellation. It's a controlled area in France um, with very very specific rules, um, and it is a sparkling wine. Um, but not all sparkling wines are champagne. Um, champagne is definitely a sparkling wine, but um, it's it's not the case that we. Um, it's a, it's only from that one area. They joke that it's a you know it's an area that's uh, just north and east of Paris, and it's on the same lines of latitude as Fargo, North Dakota, and Winnipeg, Canada. So it's way, way, way up north. And they joke that it's terrible weather, a two hundred and twenty five page um, rule book, and chalk soil that make champagne champagne. I am such a foodie. If I would like to have a glass of champagne, what kind of food to pair with? Oh, um, it is um, perhaps the most flexible wine in in the world with food, and um, it there's there's very little that disagrees with it. But for me, um, some of the things that agree with it the best. Um, our, our sushi. Um, I, I'm crazy about sushi and champagne and, and we try and do it at home, have sushi and champagne once a week. Um, it's a marvelous pairing. Of course, it goes very, very well with um, shellfish, scallops, oysters. Um, uh, also, some of the richer, older um, cuvées of champagne that are aged for longer can go very, very well with pâtés. 
um, in charcuterie. So I think that there's a wide range of things. And if you go to the region, they do all of the restaurants, all of the good restaurants offer pairing menus where every course is paired with a different champagne. Um, they even pair it with steak there. Um, I, I think that Cabernet based wines go better with steak and, um, you know, Bordeaux and, and California Cabernet don't go with much, but they go really, really well with steak. So I, I figure it's a pity to, 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 to miss an opportunity to have, uh, have your steak with, um, with a good Cabernet or Bordeaux, <laughs> but it's not, it's not a bad combination with champagne. So it's, it's, it's very, very flexible with food. Can you share how champagne is made and processed? Oh, well, it's, it's quite the process. Um, and it, it starts just like any other wine um, being grown in the vineyard. Um, in Champagne, they have to respect only certain methods of training the vines um, and only certain methods of pruning the vines. They then also have to respect set yield limits um, controlled all by the all, all by the committee champagne the appellation um, but after it's harvested it must be all harvested by hand um, because interestingly enough they're making predominantly pure white wine um, out of predominantly red grapes so um, Pinot Noir makes a big third of champagne um, Meunier, which is an indigenous grape, also um, also a dark skin grape, um, that makes a small third, and Chardonnay makes up only about twenty five percent of of the total. So they have to harvest by hand because machine harvesting would um, would prematurely damage the grapes and, and start an early maceration of the skins and the juice. So they they have to press it very very quickly. Um, and very, very gently so they can get extract just white juice from these dark grapes and not allow them to macerate with the skins. Um, one thing a lot of people aren't aware of is that even super, super dark um, wines that we think of like Cabernet, like Syrah, um, if you squeeze the grape itself, it's white juice and it's only like a, a, a maceration process of the contact of the skin with the juice that allow it to turn red. Um, and in some cases quite dark red, almost black. <laughs> but um, in Champagne, they don't want that. So they press it. They then do a regular alcoholic fermentation, which makes what they call Van Clare, which is just a still wine from Champagne. Um, after that, they bottle it with 24 grams of sugar and an addition of yeast, well, 24 grams for every liter of wine, and an addition of yeast, and in the bottle, that yeast eats all of that sugar. So there's no sugar left, and it leaves behind six atmospheres, or almost 90 pounds per square inch, of dissolved carbon dioxide. So like a road bike tire, like a bomb, a huge amount of pressure inside the bottle. Um, it also makes about an extra degree of alcohol. So the wine arrives usually at around 12%, 12.5% of alcohol um, in the end. And then they have to age it. And in Champagne, it's a mandatory that they age it in the bottle um, for a minimum of 15 months. And most good producers do not do less than three years. Um, for anything with a vintage date, it's a minimum of three years of aging, but again, good producers. I don't think that we have anything on the shelf right now that's vintage, that's younger than 2015. So that's you know seven years from the vintage, um, not not three, and and in in six years from the bottling, not 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 three. Um, so after that. They have to riddle it down. Many people have seen the, the busy riddlers um, videos of them twisting all the bottles a quarter turn, every bottle, the millions of bottles in the cellar. Um, but that process is most often now done with a, a machine um, called a Giro Palette, which just takes a little twist um, on a timer. They work all night. Um, and they don't get carpal tunnel syndrome. <laughs> it's, it's definitely a, a, a trick to do that stuff by hand. Um, and then after it's riddled down, 
the yeast is removed by a process called disgorgement and um, they, they, by turning them, they force all of the sediment down into the bottom of the bottle. It's then the cap is removed. It's almost always a beer cap that the wine's aged on. Um, the cap is removed. The yeast is shot out. And at that point, they, they might add a little bit of finishing sugar called dosage um, in with a little bit of mixture of, of wine to, to make up what was lost with the ejection of the yeast. It's corked up. It's rested usually for another six months and then it's ready to be sold. So it's, it's quite an involved process. And, um, you know, normally good producers aren't selling anything um, that it, by the time it gets to market isn't at least four years old um, with three years of time actually on the lease. That takes quite a bit of time to process to make a bottle of champagne. It does. And, you know, the, the vineyards are very, very valuable. Um, uh, the grapes are very, very valuable. Some very, very high grape prices in champagne for people who are purchasing grapes to make their wines. Um, and, you know, it takes a huge amount of space um, because it's, it takes a lot less space to, to, to keep wine in barrels and tanks than it does to keep them in bottle. Um, so in the end, I think while champagne is never cheap, um, for, for fine wine, um, I think that it's still, there's still a lot of value in it, especially, um, if you can, you can get a good one at can a really, really good one at K&L for $35, which, you know, puts it in the range that a normal person for a special occasion can, can afford it. So you mentioned earlier that was a three different type of grapes. Uh, those only three types of grapes can make champagne. Yeah, oh, you got all the best questions. <laughs> it's a, it, they are, um, you know, the the other grapes aren't on the test, <laughs> but there are a small amount of other grapes that are um, allowed in the appellation. There's a few of them that are indigenous. There's a, a one called Arban and one called Petit Melier. Um, which are indigenous to the region. These are now being looked at pretty seriously um, as perhaps um, a, a way, a hedge against global warming because they're very, very, very high in acid. And they, they, tried, to, they tried to get rid of them. Um, they didn't ban them, but when the phylloxera louse struck, um, they only made a, the subsidy for replanting in France for the three grapes that we talked about already. So that effectively almost well, almost wiped them out because everybody was broke. Uh, their vineyards were dying from phylloxera and, and they needed the subsidy. Um, there's also Pinot Blanc is also allowed. That's actually the most popular um, grape after the big the big three. But that being said, I mean, it's next to nothing. I mean, all of the other grapes put together don't account for 1%. Um, and also Pinot Gris is allowed. And then there are, uh, Gamay is also allowed. I've never, ever seen it. Never seen a Gamay plant in more than 50 trips to Champagne. Never tasted a Champagne that had Gamay in it, but it, it does exist. Um, and apparently there's a... a a new experimental grape um, that's um, being allowed in the Appalachian, which is also too new for me to um, have tasted. Are there certain ways to store champagne and how long they will be good for? You know, the cellaring champagne, um, I just got back from a trip um, to Champagne Lombois, um, one of our oldest uh, direct imports um, in, in, in the village of Menil. And we did a tasting there um, where we, we tasted stuff from the early 2000s, from the 90s, um, from the 80s, from the 70s, and we went all the way back to 1959. And all of the wines were still fresh and delicious, totally drinkable. My favorite wine of the whole lunch, where we consume many, 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 many wines, was the 1975. Um, so champagne is capable of extraordinary, um, extraordinary longevity, um, but it's super sensitive to storage. Um, and when they talk about the, the chalk and champagne, most of the time they're talking about the chalk in, in terms of it being a good soil with good drainage. 
um, and great properties for the grapevines. And I think that they undersell the chalk as um, possibly the easiest of all soils to excavate. Because it's so easy to excavate, they have the biggest um, and, and arguably the very, very best sellers in the entire world in Champagne with a totally dead even 55 degree temperature year in, year out. Um, it's so easy to dig the stuff out that they have a moratorium on it in the city of Epernay because there are more miles of tunnels um, by a lot under, under the city than there are roads above it. And... Um, you know, it's it's Swiss cheese. I mean, they're they, they're pushing the limit, and they don't want stuff to start falling in, in into the holes. So, um, you know, it's it's definitely um, it's the, the storage conditions are so critical, and I think that without those great caves, you probably wouldn't have champagne um, because you need a place to store it for a long time. So, when the customer gets at home, if they have a good quality wine refrigerator a good quality temperature controlled cellar or a good quality, you know, earth in, in the earth, you know, down, down deep cellar, um, the wines can be kept for, for decades. Um, even non-vintage wines, I think they unambiguously improve for, for two or three years um, in good storage. Bad storage is really bad for champagne and it can it can go south in a hurry. As we were talking about before we started it rolling today, you know, one one hot day in the car can can really mess your wine up pretty bad. Question about champagne in France. And I know France has lots of vineyard almost throughout the country. Why does champagne only produce in such small region in France? So there, the reason that it's only produced in a very small region is because it's only, that area is the only place that's really suitable um, for making the style of wine that um, has been come to know as champagne. It, it, it could be technically feasible to um, add on to the, the appellation some stuff that was, was included in some areas that were included in the past. They almost did that about 10 years ago. And then they, they politically, it just, it, it got, and it was a quagmire and it just got, it got jammed up. I think right now it's completely planted. There's no area um, that could be champagne that could have the Appalachian that doesn't have vines on it or isn't, you know, just waiting um, after being dug up to, to be replanted. Um, you know, potentially they could add a small percentage more. Um, there's some some area in just north of, of where the limit is now that has the right type of chalk soil. Um, but there's not really a, a lot of area that is um, is suitable that has the right soil and the right climate. And I also like to know why ladies always more attract to champagne. Is it due to the historical issues or its taste? You know, women are much, much better tasters physiologically than men. Um, and I think that that has, uh, I think that has something to do with it. I think that women have better palates. So they, um, they tend to, to gravitate towards the better things more quickly than, than, than men do. Um, but I think the history is also a huge part of it. It's uh, always been, uh, you know, associated with, with elegance. It's always been, um, of course, had a great association, as you mentioned, with Marie Antoinette, with, um, with other great celebrities around the world. And I'm sure that that also plays a part in it. But I think the beautiful light nature of the wine um, that never, that still never lacks depth and complexity um, is just very, very attractive for, for, for modern women. And also for the for the food that um, that that the lighter food that modern women eat. So um, personally, I I'm very very grateful that most of my customers are are women because 
Um, women also do, they don't seem to forget that they're, that they're into something because they like it. <laughs> and with men, boy, with some of the whiskey guys, it's just like, you, you wonder, it's like, man, do you, you remember that the reason that you won't, that you, that you're doing this is because you like it. <laughs> they get so caught up in the minutia and, um, concerned with, um, things that might be a little less relevant that uh, it's sometimes disappointing, but, um, you know, luckily it doesn't seem like many women fall into that trap. <laughs> And I think champagne is pretty. It is. I pretty. love that little bubbles in the champagne glass. I'm wondering what colors are in champagne? Oh, another great question. Um, the, so the, the committee champagne has made red champagne illegal. So there, there is a um, separate appellation called Coteau de Champenois Rouge for still red wine from the area, but for champagne proper, um, red is not allowed. So you're allowed to have it white or you're allowed to have it rosé, but <laughs> they don't have a way of defining the difference between rosé and red. So uh, I had a great friend who's unfortunately passed away whose wines we used to import, Pascal Leclerc, and he made a dark, 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 dark rosé called the Rubis rosé and the, the committee always used to give him a hard time for it and say man this is red champagne and he'd say no it's just it's pink and they didn't have like it's not like there's a color like a panatone wheel or something that you can't go past so um uh, effectively um you can make it you can make it pretty dark and get away with it um since they don't have a have a great definition for it um but in fact um, the colors range, I would say, from almost clear um, for young Blanc de Blanc, young pure Chardonnays, um, through a marvelous array of white gold, light straw, all the way out to, 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 to pretty deep golds when you're talking about old stuff, um, like some of these ones that we were, we were just, I was just tasting with the Lamois, you know, from the, from, from the fifties and the, in the seventies, they can be, be, be quite golden. So when you taste champagne from fifties and seventies, are those bottle champagnes that still taste as good as it did originally? They taste totally different than, than, than they do when they're young. And, um, I've been in the business now long enough to have tasted stuff, had an opportunity to taste the same wine, young and old, and they change a lot. Um, but for me, I would say for the most part, they improve. Um, it's not to everybody's taste. Um, the, the, all of the, um, the, the granddaughters of the Lawmaw family, the ones that are, you know, in their, in their, in their early 20s none of them like the taste of old champagne um but for for champagne connoisseurs the taste of old champagne is a very um very very sought after and a huge premium is paid for for these old champagnes um they they get more and more brioche like um they get more and more um complex they definitely get um weightier uh, but the bubbles can survive for as long as, as people can. Um, so the, they, they stay effervescent and the best ones have both uh, Venus deep, profound character and also but manage to maintain their acidity and their brightness. Um, so the, the very, very best of them give you, give you both things. I recently checked online and bought of a 1959 Dom Perignon Rosé cost nearly $74,900. <laughs> is this is sound right to you? Can it be so expensive? Um, well, you know, they have a very interesting system with Dom Perignon and what you might have seen, it might have been one of their P3 offerings. Um, so they will age... They call their their current release their so the 2012 that they're selling right now. Um, they call that the, the the P1 or the Plentitude One. So that's when they figure that it's mature enough to sell. You know, so that's what is that? That's 10 years old. Um, and then they hold back a large amount of the production 
um, for a second release, which they called the Plentitude 2. So currently the Plentitude 2 is on 2003. So almost 20 years, 19 years old. Um, and then they have another another set where they figure the wine has reached its um, really its 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 fullest potential on the on the of aging on the lees. And these are all freshly disgorged. We were talking about that process of riddling down and disgorging. So these are all wines that have been kept in the cellar. Um, so the Plentitude Three, they are, they're selling stuff, you know, from from the '80s, from the '70s, from the '60s, and and perhaps as you saw, that could be that '59 could be from from that program. Um, but I would argue that it's seventy five thousand um, dollars. That's a, a way of getting in the Rob report, <laughs> not a way of selling wine. And and oftentimes for these big companies, um, you know. They, if they are, if they have a hundred of these bottles, it's better to list them at a price where they won't sell, but something that gets a lot of attention rather than at a price that that, that will sell. How interesting! Yeah, a lot of the producers just won't sell them at all because the, it, 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 at that age, you know, we say in the wine business that there are no great great old wines. There's only great old bottles of wine. Um, and because the fermentation, ha all the most important development happens in the bottle, that secondary fermentation, that aging on the lees, they happen in individual bottles. When you get out that old, there can be quite a bit of variation from two bottles that were basically sitting next to each other in the same cellar. Um, so a lot of people prefer not to sell them, but to use them for tasting events where somebody qualified from the Maison can can taste them first. And if there's one that has a problem, reject it. Since you mentioned about bottle, I noticed Champagne has a different bottle sizes. Can you explain why they oh. do that? So the bottle sizes in Champagne to me are... are are really fascinating. So with all wines, you know, the, all wines are offered in a variety of sizes. And, you know, with red wine for aging, the bigger the bottle, um, the slower it ages because you have basically the same amount of air, that little nickel size of air in, but much higher volumes of wine as you, as you go up in size. But in Champagne, you not only have that, but you also have the fact that the bubbles um, and all of the most important development are happens, the bubbles are born, all the most important development happens within the bottle. So, you know, you have in Champagne, um, the most common sizes are halves, half bottles, 750s, you know, standard size bottles, 750 milliliters, and then Magnums, which is a double size bottle, or 1500 milliliters. Um, but there's also 187s, which are a half of a half, they call those splits, and then it goes on up. You know, there's the Jeroboam at three liters, there's the Methuselah at six liters, there's the Nebuchadnezzar at nine liters, all the way on up to the Premot at 30 liters, which is the biggest one I've ever seen. Um, but they're only commanded by law to bottle ferment them in half, 750, Magnum, and Jeroboam. So it, the 187 size, they're allowed to transfer, to pour them out of, out of bottles to fill the other ones. So the quality just takes a huge hit on anything that's transferred. Anything above three liter, they're also allowed to transfer. So you want those to be, be fresh unless you know the producer is doing um, doing a bottle fermentation in those large sizes. Um, the glass becomes much less consistent. So you'll see in the cellars of people that are doing six liters and nine liters actually in the bottle and bottle fermenting them, they wrap them in plastic because if they explode because of an inconsistency in the glass and the, the glass isn't as consistent as the 750s are, um, you know, they can, they can hurt somebody and they can take out a lot of bottles next to them. So they, you'll see them wrapped in plastic. So just in case there's a problem, it just spills out on the floor and doesn't, 
stab anybody in the neck with glass. <laughs> but um, the big bottles are a lot of fun. We actually sell quite a few of them, mostly for um, corporate milestones. Um, it's a, you know, that's the 30 liter that I, that I sold was to a, 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 a real big company that probably everybody knows the name of here in Menlo Park um, for one of their milestones. Do you have any recommendation if a beginners like to try out champagne? What do you recommend? Oh, well, I am. First of all, I would just say go for it. You know, um, what what I would recommend is, you know, you, you, to find a find a, a retailer that you trust, a, a good wine store. Um, you know, you can always come and see me at k and I'm there on the sales floor three days a week. Um, and, and, you know, if you want to educate yourself on them, it's, it's really fun to compare a few, um, you know, side by side. And champagne really does well um, with a, if you have a champagne stopper and you open it up and you pour a couple of glasses and stick a stopper on it and get it into the body of the refrigerator rather than on the door where it's getting shaken around every time you reach in there for the mustard, um, it'll last extremely well because it basically has its own inert gas, the CO2, coming up out of the wine to force out the oxygen and, and preserve the wine against oxidation. Um, so it's like um, having a, a gas system, except the gas system is in the wine. Um, but they last very well. So if you get a couple and you open them um, to compare them, it may be one that's a Blonde de Blanc, 100% Chardonnay, and one perhaps that's a Blonde de Noir that's, that's all dark grapes. Um, that can make a very, very interesting comparison and be quite a revelation. Um, because most of the time, champagne is not tasted carefully. Um, most of the time it's served as an aperitif. You're at a party. Um, you're trying to remember people's names. It's given to you cold. It's given to you in a flute that's probably very, very narrow that makes the bubbles look pretty, but difficult to get the schnoz in to smell, um, that pours the wine in a very thin line over your tongue. Um, rather than the wider, uh, a wider brim glass will pour the wine in a wider swath over your tongue and allow you to taste it better. A wider opening will allow you to smell the wine better. So I would say if you're at home and you're tasting it, put it in a wine glass um, instead of a flute or put it in both and, and check out the difference. Um, the flute's going to make it look a lot prettier. It's going to save that fountain of bubbles. Um, but you're going to be able to smell it and taste it better out of a regular wine glass. So I would say that if you're interested in learning more, um, starting out by doing a comparison um, of a couple of champagnes that are in different styles and starting out by using perhaps a couple of different vessels, um, you know, the CO2 does a lot for transferring aromas. So the CO2... Um, will carry aromas up through the wine and um, it definitely makes it champagne less sensitive to the vessel than, 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 than other wines. Um, but it is a pretty big difference if you've got a narrow flute in a regular wine glass, you can smell and taste a lot more in the regular glass. That's great to know. I would never try in a wine glass for my champagne. The last question for you. You mentioned earlier about champagne different color, white and rosé. Do they have a different taste? Absolutely. What? You know, and they're, they're, they're very variable. Rosé, champagne um, is made primarily in two, two different ways or a, a combination of the two ways. Um, it's either made by an addition of red wine. So the producer will make a small batch of totally dark, red wine with a long maceration of the skins and the juice. And then they'll add in, you know, between five and 12% of that until they get the right aromas and colors uh, and the right color. That's the most common way of making rosé champagne. Um, the, the other way is to have all of the skins in contact with all of the juice. Um, that's much less common um, because all of the skins have to be perfect. Um, if there's a little bit of botrytis on, on the skins, the, or a little bit of rot, um, it's not really a problem for, for white juice because they press it gently and quickly. But if you're macerating the botrytis 
grapes with your juice. It doesn't take very many um, poor quality skins to ruin the whole batch. So for the addition method of adding red wine to white, the most popular one, um, the most famous one is Biacard Samon. And that is um, very, very elegant, very light pink in color, um, but still has that, that strawberry uh, fruit, uh, that elusive fruit that you get with rosé um, that you don't get with, with, with white champagne. The biggest proponent of um, skin contact is Laurent Perrier. And they're the Laurent Perrier and on vintage rosé, all of the skins are in contact with all of the juice entirely from growing crude grapes. They have to do a big selection for that. And with that wine, you definitely get a lot more of the sort of cherry aromas while still maintaining a completely dry and elegant wine. Um, but that's another great comparison that people are interested in. Those are the two sort of benchmark rosés and they can be very, very fun to compare. Thank you so much, Gary. They are very informative information for my listeners. Oh, well, you're most welcome. And, and thank you so much for the time. And if, um, if anybody has any, any questions um, for me, if they've got an interest in champagne, I'm easy to find. Um, I'm at, at k and in Redwood City. Um, my, if you search k and Wines and Gary Westby, you can find me on the staff directory, find my email, which is just Gary Westby at klwines.com. I'm also on Instagram at Champagne Gary Westby. You can, you can reach out to me that way as well. Great. I will link your websites to the video. Thank you so much for your time, Daphne. Thank you for having me on. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye.